What is the evolution of plant breeding? We asked Ian Affleck, Vice President of Plant Biotechnology at CropLife Canada. So as we talk about plant breeders and the evolution of the activity of plant breeding, you can really trace its roots right back to the beginning of agriculture almost 10,000 years ago. So as hunter-gatherers started realizing that it's a lot less work if I just drop seeds outside my hut and grow the wheat there than it is to go chase it in a field somewhere, hunting and gathering wheat plants, if you will, then we became agriculturalists. And once we started agriculture, we started to realize that if we just kept the best seeds, the, the most hardy or the ones we liked the most, that the next year they would resemble those more. So those really early agricultural ancestors were selecting for genetics. They just didn't know it. Uh, they didn't realize they were selecting for certain genes, but that's what they were doing. They were picking the plants that worked best for them in agriculture and continuing them forward. Uh, and then as that kept moving on, we domesticated more crops. We started growing them in rows and really started, started to look like the agriculture that we see today. But that really was the limit of technological advancement for about six, 7,000 years. Um, then we really started to notice that if we really picked the, the plants that expressed the plant parts we like to eat the most, we could just have more of those plant parts. So a good example is broccoli in the form that we see it in today really didn't exist before about 600 BCE. That's when we started taking wild mustard and just choosing the pieces we like to eat the most. So they got bigger and bigger. And that wild mustard or wild cabbage plant basically turned into broccoli. And I'll talk a little bit more about that because it's one of my favorite examples of kind of how we selected crops to, to work in agriculture the way we needed them to. But after that, it wasn't really a lot of um, advancements until uh, the 1700s where we started to realize that you can cross different plants um, that are closely related. So uh, the example in the little picture here is a grapefruit and grapefruit didn't exist before 1750. Uh, someone planted a Jamaican sweet orange and an Indonesian pomelo beside each other on a tropical island and they cross pollinated and then they got this really tasty fruit that came from it. And that's how we ended up through cross breeding these two species to get grapefruit. So it's another food we often think was around forever, but it's actually in the history of agriculture, it's pretty new. Um, so again, not a whole lot of advancement in plant breeding other than realizing we can do crosses until about 1863. Then if you remember from high school biology class, uh, we talked about Gregor Mendel and the smooth peas and the wrinkly peas and the heritability of genetics, kind of like the heritability of eye color when you think about it in humans. And he realized there's math behind this. There's there, there's a ratio at which these traits move. We can track it, we can understand it. Um, so he really started to begin the understanding of genetics and how that all works. So that was a big leap forward in plant breeding is knowing exactly mathematically how to move the genes we want from one place to another. So that, that was really important. Then you move forward to about 1940. And, and although we're moving genes we've wanted to over these years, there's something else we were doing that was really important is um, like in a human, when you, you're not just the child of your mother and your father, you're 49% um, the DNA of one and 49% the DNA of another. And then there's a little bit of random um, mutations, uniqueness in just in you. And that's the same in crop plants. So when you make your crosses or the next generation of the plant comes, there'll be little differences. And sometimes these can be really beneficial. So in the 40s, realizing that these rare and, and small changes are really beneficial. And that's what we're looking for in plant breeding. We learned ways to encourage those changes to happen more often so that we could get to the changes we knew would arrive, but we could get to them more efficiently uh, and, and deliver those better varieties a little faster. So there's a whole bunch of plant breeding techniques we started using in the 1940s to kind of drive that forward. Then you move on to 73 and a grad student comes up with essentially what we call our DNA, or that's what you'll hear in pop culture as GMOs that invented that technique. Uh, and then that took forward to kind of bringing forward the first wave of genetically modified crops uh, or GMOs um, with uh, the first being grown in Canada to be corn, soybean, and canola. We still grow a lot of those today. Over 90% of those three crops uh, are GM varieties here in Canada today. So from there, we move forward. Another kind of important milestone in the history there was uh, the papaya industry in Hawaii was being devastated by a ring spot virus. And a university professor there uh, endeavored to use um, that RDNA technology, that genetic modification technology to make the plants resistant to that disease. He was successful. He gave that technology to the farmers, saving the, um, the papaya industry. 
um, in Hawaii. And now, you know, 80, 90% of all the papaya in the world is genetically modified um, because it's so successful in preventing that kind of disease. So moving forward to the 2000s, when we talked about, you know, gene editing is one tool in a bucket of many, um, a lot of new tools came along to help that plant breeder do what they're doing. Um, uh, and that's genetic selection, it's marker, marker assisted breeding. There's a whole bunch of things they rarely get talked about. Uh, it's really gene editing and GMOs that are the, the ones that make the headlines, but there's a lot of different tools that are available to plant breeders and they use them all in trying to bring those varieties uh, to market. So then uh, some, some other interesting milestones in 2014, we start to see kind of a, a new wave of GM crops come through that are more consumer focused um, that provide different traits like non-browning and non-bruising. So you lose less of the apple, um, whether you're processing it into slices or whether you drop your apple on the floor, um, this will help it uh, not bruise as quickly. So you don't uh, have as much food waste there. It's an easier food to consume. And similar for the potato, traits like that start coming along that, that help out in the food side uh, of the equation. So this is kind of the history of where plant breeding has come from. Uh, in the last 10,000 years. But just to kind of drive it home visually, uh, some good examples here of kind of what wheat looked like 10,000 years ago, tiny seeds, they'd fall off the head really easily. So if you're farming it, that's really uh, inefficient because you're losing the seeds on the ground. So they selected them for bigger, stronger, better seeds until you get to the common wheat where the grain looks like it is today. Uh, corn's another great example, which started as teosinte, which is the grass on the left little tiny plant with really hard seeds. You basically have to smash them with a rock into a powder so that you can make the flour out of them. And then through thousands of years of selection of choosing larger, softer kernels, you get to the, the modern corn that we have today, which is much better suited for agriculture and much easier um, for us to consume. Another great example is kind of what the wild banana looked like back then toward what it looks like now by selecting for the genes that expressed smaller seeds and softer seeds, you got rid of those big seeds you see in that banana on the left that were inedible and got them down to the tiny little edible seeds that you see in the bananas we have today. So a lot more edible fruit uh, in the same size banana. So that's kind of how we can really have that impact over thousands of years of selecting for the gene expression that we're looking for. That's what plant breeding is all about. And this is one of my favorite examples. If you take Brassica oleraceae, which is wild cabbage or sometimes called wild mustard, Depending on where you are, or what part of the world you're in, you were selecting for different things you like to eat from that plant. So if you like terminal buds, you just select for those and eventually it started to look like cabbage. If you just like the stem, it would start to look like kohlrabi. So all of these plants, Brussels sprouts, kale, broccoli, cauliflower, they're the same plant. They're all wild cabbage, just expressing different elements of their genes more than their counterparts. So these are similar to you see a yellow potato and a red potato and a russet potato. Those are all potatoes. They're all the same. They just express different traits. That's the same here. These are all the same plant. They just express different traits. So I don't know who spent thousands of years choosing for Brussels sprouts. I wouldn't have spent time on that one personally, but that's all the same effort um, to get to food products that fit uh, either the lifestyle or the culture or the region in which you live. 